Hello and welcome. I recently sat down with Grammy Award-winning American jazz pianist and R&B singer Patrice Russian. As the eldest child of her family, her experience with music started at an early age. She began playing the piano at only six years old. She would later become the first woman to serve as the music director for the 46th, 47th, and 48th Grammy Awards. Russian currently serves as an ambassador for the Artistry in Education at Berklee College of Music. She's also the chair of the University of Southern California Thornton School of Music. During our conversation, she reveals possibilities, creative thinking, and the many transferable skills that the study of music and music education provides. So join us as we get into the story of music with Patrice Russian. So when I was three years old, I was in a nursery school situation. Both my parents worked and there's six years between my younger sister and I. Mm -hmm. So the, I was an only child for that, for that first five, six years. So I was in the school and the teacher there used to notice that whenever we do any singing or dancing, that I would come to life and so she told my parents, and they said, oh, that's great. What do we do about it? She says, there's a program that happened to be going on at the University of Southern California mm. that was a grad course for people in music education to study and develop certain kinds of theories about early childhood development with kids who seem to have musical gifts. They were developing theories and things like this. Now, this was back before we knew what we know now, and that is that Children at that age are like sponges, and right. they are picking up so many things that resonate with their, with their soul and resonate with their heart that Im, uh, are imprints that last as they go forward. And inform choices they make exactly. later on, yes. Exactly, so I was in this program, and we were singing, waving scarves and stuff, and learning music, and they were watching us and seeing that we heard music the same. They approached the music from the standpoint of the way the music made kids feel. Mm. And the idea of music and feeling was embedded right then for me, that there was an association between sound and between that sound and feeling, between rhythm and the way your body would move, between colors for some of the kids who would hear certain sounds or chords, that sounds red, that sounds green, because little kids only have a limited vocabulary. I went through all of this. After about two years, they introduced an instrument. The instrument that was chosen for me was piano. At that time, I learned piano through the classics. So I went through that kind of development of learning that instrument, and it was in high school, maybe junior high school, middle school, that playing the piano was fun for me, but all the cool kids carried a case. And they were walking around with the trumpet case and the flute case and the clarinet case, and I don't have no case, I've got this piano, I can't move. Can't move. And, and I can't be in the orchestra or the band necessarily. So I took up the flute and had my case and my flute. <laughs> and you know where the flutes sit in the orchestra is right in the middle. In a concert band, they sit on the side and they see everything. And suddenly I'm not playing all the time. Sometimes I have rests and I'm listening to the sounds that are happening around me and then I have to come in and contribute. And it changed my entire viewpoint of music. It changed the way I played piano. It changed everything, and for me, the idea, the thing that grabbed me then mm -hmm. were the organization of these sounds mm -hmm. from the standpoint of possibly the composer. Right. And that's, that seed was planted in junior high school. All through high school, I went to an all-black high school, mm -hmm. and there was a big movement at that time, post-Watts riots and, and, and some of the other um, civil rights things that had happened as I was a kid. Big movement for us to be able to, 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 to really be about what our parents really wanted us to be about, to be about excellence, mm -hmm. and that that was not an option for us for where they wanted us to go and where we wanted to go. Mm -hmm. And at this school, we learned, we had a large band, and we learned uh, a lot about African American history through the music. Mm -hmm. And we studied uh, all kinds of things, and of course, we were out playing a lot, 
and performing a lot. So you're developing a lot of things. You're developing a wherewithal for the world we live in. Right. You're developing an appreciation for the music that was created by people that look like you. Therefore, your value system on, on the practice and the regimen of learning all music is enhanced. Mm -hmm. And that was a big part of me being able to find myself. Because although I had studied classical music at the piano for many years, I didn't see myself there a lot. And so therefore didn't see myself doing that. Right. Learned to, pl to play jazz, which represented the American classical music. Right. And expanded beyond that into a lot of other musical forms because I wanted to be that good. That was what was put on us. Yeah. That excellence as a musician gave you options for a lot of different things. Excellence as a musician gave you options for a lot of different things, powerful phrase. And I want to lean into something else you said, um, an appreciation and experience into my music, my cultural history through music, deepened your relationship and your ability to lean into other forms of music. Exactly. You also spoke about um, picking up another instrument and the, what that did for your understanding of the previous instrument. Can you, can you say some more about, mm -hmm. about that? The idea of being in a, in a, having an experience mm -hmm. of at the same time that you are in the, in the process of, the, of, of music making, you are also experiencing the music that's being made around you. And the contributions and the give and take that happens between artists who are performing together, working together, not unlike what you would say in sports or something like that, where there's a team, where there's an effort to impart a larger moment, a larger experience for an audience. There's an experience that's going on right there in the middle of the orchestra. So when I transferred some of that instrument, information to my piano playing, the piano then became my little orchestra right in front of me. I've got the bass, I've got the baritone instruments, I've got the alto instruments, I've got the, all of the beautiful high colors and everywhere in between. It's, it was very complete. Now when I'm playing piano music, after this experience of being a cog in a, in a larger wheel, then it's about a certain kind of expression and about a certain kind of communication that can happen at the piano in terms of a certain touch, a certain dynamic, a certain register where something is played and that it's all there in front of you. That was informed, ironically, by playing in orchestras mm -hmm. and actually feeling and hearing you know, those sounds and then wanting to emote those same kinds of feelings at the piano, transferable information. The fascinating conversation around how the collaborative experience is informing then the solo artist, right? Um, mm -hmm. that, is, that is powerful. Can you talk, talk to us a little bit more about what it is like playing in an orchestra that, or a marching band, mm -hmm. that, that, I, that, that collaboration where you are part of this larger whole yep. that's, that's, that's making this music that is also being directed externally, guided. Guided. Externally, mm -hmm. yeah. Can yeah. you talk to us about that experience? Um, I think that it changes your awareness and your perception as a listener. Mm. Anything that you have tried to do yourself, you really do appreciate it when you see it done well by somebody else. Because suddenly, you have an experience that makes you understand what the person who is able to transmit the, the information, uh, or the, their artistry, you get what it takes to be able to do that because you've tried to do it. And most artists that I have met, the way we learn things best is experientially. Yes. Even if you fail, if you try to do it and it doesn't go so well, if you are encouraged go do it again, and go do it again. And what you learn is that on the way to this greatness are all these little victories that you have to have that might look like it's this big, but you keep trying and you keep doing and you keep learning and you amass a certain understanding of your, of your particular art form. And for so many of us, especially um, 
my generation, for so many of us, seeing excellence in music looked like a lot of things. Mm -hmm. It looked like Adolphus Hellstorp. It looked like Earth, Wind, and Fire. It looked like James Brown. <laughs> it looked like uh, Miles Davis. It looked like Soul Train. It looked like Prince. It looked like the, it looked like a lot a lot of things. Yeah. In addition to what was what else was going on in the world that we were beginning to understand and, gra and grasp, mm -hmm. it looked like the Black Panthers. It looked like Angela Davis. It looked like Paul Robeson. Mm -hmm. It looked like Martin Luther King. In other words, there was a lot of information that gave um, weight mm -hmm. to the idea of to be excellence takes time, mm -hmm. it takes time, it takes effort, and that there are no barriers uh, other than the ones you put on yourself. Right, and I am really inspired by the way you talk about excellence as, as a thing that is accessible, right? And that you, through the names you're calling, you're not speaking about that which they did, but the demonstration of excellence. And there is a, there's a socialization and, and education and schooling that allowed you and your peers to be able to recognize that mm -hmm. at the time you did and to be able to then, for somebody like yourself, to be able to wholly lean into the possibilities of all those areas, right? Because mm -hmm. a lot of the names you've called, you've worked with mm -hmm. um, as well and created even more excellence because you've come together. One of the things we talked about earlier in our pregame <laughs> was how the study of education, the formal study of music education, so to speak, um, allows the thinker to deconstruct information in a particular way and how that may inform your work as a composer. Do you mind um, speaking to us about that, oh, giving yeah, us some sure. examples? <laughs> so I was telling you the story that after high school, I was going to go to college. Uh, my parents, you know, very progressive people, wanted the best for, for, for us, you know, as kids, and said, okay, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I want to be a composer. I want to be a composer for specifically film and television. That's right. I also want to be a jazz musician. And they both looked at me and they said, that's nice. What would your real job be? <laughs> And they meant well, but you know, two black people had migrated from the South and came West and they were, you know, they really wanted the best for their kids and they wanted to know that they'd be able to take care of themselves, being excellent, doing what they loved, but could eat. <laughs> so our deal for me to go to music school, because I knew I wanted to stay in Los Angeles because the film industry was there. Right. And I didn't have the other, the other parts of the path worked out. They said, well, what about music education? So I said, well, if that's what it'll take for you to help me with school, okay. So I was a music education major, classical piano minor, because that's what they had in, in, in USC. I went there at the time. And they didn't have any jazz. And they didn't have, of course, they didn't have popular music uh, at all. This was not a major then. And what I learned from that music education environment of learning how to teach, was that those skills were transferable. Those were the same mechanisms that go into record production, music direction, and it is about having large concepts, sometimes difficult ones, breaking them down into actionable bites, offering that information to your students, and helping them feel that they are discovering in the process of learning how these things are put together. It's a very interesting dance. Part of it is a mind game. Part of it is showmanship. Part of it is all of the things that a creative person uh, thrives on, and that is an interest and an enthusiasm about something that allows people to go further than they thought they could, and to be able to offer information on which they may build something. That's right. That is transferable information for many different kinds of jobs. And what I also learned and continue to marvel at is the process of that is very often the way that I have approached 
music. Um, I'm one of those people, who are chronic, used to be anyway, chronic procrastinator. Mm. But if you give me a project and a deadline, it's on. If I'm left to my own devices, I have 50,000 ideas and I might not get it started right away and it might drift over here and it's not neat and pretty, it's a control skid mm. at all times. But I think that that has to do with the creative mind and creative space. And one of the things that I'm allowed to do because I have certain uh, techniques that, were, that came from understanding how to teach others I learned how to teach myself and learned how to manage that so that projects and ideas can actually take action. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when the work start to teach you about itself and so you realize that, <laughs> oh, I'm the one in process here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> what we call is the end is a point of <laughs> pause for my process. <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, thank you, thank you um, so much for sharing that. It's oftentimes folks look at the arts field as the arts field and what you started to speak to just now are how the study of creative areas produce or provide individuals with transferable skills for many areas, for many fields. What you're talking about in music education is a focus on the process. And earlier when you talked about experiencing that yourself, you spoke about the feeling, right? What it may feel like and how kids may speak about their experience of it, right? A limited vocabulary may produce what this feels like, it looks like, it smells like it. I can attach it immediately to senses, yes. right? So the arts and its relationship to the senses is what um, arts education really is looking at, the experience, the process, and they're allowing an individual to discover something for themselves. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that so eloquently. We are here um, in anticipation of this piece that um, is premiering tomorrow, and I'm about to go downstairs in here in this dress rehearsal. Um, what, um, what can you share with us about this upcoming premiere? Okay. Well, uh, my piece, Symphonia, was actually a piece that was written in private protest. I had begun doing work in film and television. And big shows, I was allowed to do some pretty big shows, Emmys, People's Choice Awards, as music director. But when it, came, when it got to be my turn, when they called me, they said, you know, we're going to cut the budget this time a little bit. No strings or no woodwinds or only so many brass. Or only so. so I became very adept at taking these small little bands and choirs of instruments and giving them a certain fullness and giving them a certain completeness in terms of their sound. It was great training. But one day I said, are they ever going to give me the full palette? I mean, it's like, you know, trying to do something standing on one leg all the time. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, why am I waiting for them to tell me to do it? Why don't I just, if I want to write something, write something. So that's what Symphonia started off being. And I wrote the first movement and had my cathartic moment of, exp of expression. It was hard. It was difficult for me to do it. And especially because it wasn't an assignment, it was something I was doing for myself. Right. And it, so it challenged that moment for me of like, you'll do it for other people, but you won't do it for you. It, all of these things came up while I'm trying to write this piece, which is I just want to use the colors in my box. I was literally, I finished that first movement, I was putting it literally in a box to put it in my closet. And I got a call from Bill Banfield. We had known each other for years, and he would call me periodically to check on me and, and me on him. And this was one of those days, and he just called. He said, hey, what you doing? I said, I am boxing up a piece that no one will ever hear. And he says, oh, no, you're not. He says, well, talk, talk to me about the piece. And I said, well, it's just an orchestral piece. I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel. I just want to use all the colors in the box. And I met, you know, I had lamented with him before that I didn't get to do that. He says, listen, you know they have these reading contests 
that you should enter it into one of them and ask them to read it. And if it wins a spot, uh, you know, I'll come. Wherever they're gonna do read it, I'll come. He says, this thing is in Minneapolis. If you send it in to the American Composers Forum, if it gets p picked for a read, I'll meet you there. And he, it got picked. He kept his word. He and Crystal came, and they sat with me and listened to this piece. They, that orchestra finished playing the piece? He says, you going to finish it now? <laughs> uh, uh, and I, it, was, it was an amazing thing to hear that organism, that instrument, the orchestra, yes. back to me. Because at this point, as much music of mine that I had heard come back to me, that experience was somehow different. So I uh, decided to finish it, and I did. And uh, it got read again by the Detroit Symphony in another reading contest. Mm -hmm. I won that spot. That opened the gate for some other commissions and things like that. So the, the, the performance tonight, or tomorrow night, will only be the second time that I have heard the entire symphony mm. played since 1999. Wow, we are honored. So, so and I, I hear the applause from Bill's piece. So yes. let's go down and hear yours. All right. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you so much. All right. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Such a wonderful conversation with Patrice Russian. And I'm glad I was able to sit down with her and share in her journey through this wonderful art form of music and music education. And I want to end by highlighting something she said that the study of music education um, allows for. She, was, she said it was about having large concepts and sometimes difficult ones and breaking them down into actionable bites, offering that information to your students and then helping them feel like they are discovering in the process of learning. This interview makes me think of the never ending possibilities that are available to our children when they have access to all the colors in the box. Thank you for joining us.